Okay, so we're trying to help our students think statistically, and we've talked about kind of those five key takeaways that we can incorporate into our conversations as we're planning out the investigation, as we're collecting the data, as we're making meaning of the data. But as we've talked about, right, visualizing the data is such a key part and such a helpful thing to helping our students make sense of data. So how can we think about our visualizations with this perspective of statistical thinking? Well, so I'm going to show a couple different examples of how of some options for how we can draw it in. So, you know, here's a kind of classic physics example, a classic physics experiment, or what I like to call it demonstration, right, where we are collecting data to demonstrate a concept that we already know of sort of like, what's the relationship between distance and time? If we roll this ball down the ramp, how do we get at that piece? And oftentimes we like collect the data in that data file and then we, you know, we put that data in, we either draw it out by hand or we put it into Google Sheets or we can use something like Data Classroom um, to make, to plot our data and, and actually look at those values, to take those steps of like, we're going to record on a table, then we're going to convert it into the, its platform or into its graph and we're going to look at it. Another way is if we just shrink down the, the demonstration so here we've got books, we've got a you know, piece of cardboard, we've got a marble that can roll down, and we have a cup with the front of the cup cut out so that it's big enough for the marble to get in. And then we've got some paper. So this is the sort of the profile view, and then here's the bird's eye view looking down. So what it is, is you roll the marble down a ruler, um, and then it hits the cup, and then you draw a line at the back end of the cup. So this is not quantitative. We are not actually, you know, finding the numbers. So if you want to, um, I mean, you could, you could make this quantitative. You could put a scale here. So if you wanted kids to calculate um, velocity of how fast the marble was going, you know, when it hit down, when from when you released it to its final destination, you you could calculate that out. But you also could just show, right? You'll see that these lines are different, and so they inherently are seeing oh, there's not one value for how fast that, that marble rolls. And these are actually like different cups, so that's another variable that you could add in. Or you could even just plot it on one dimension. So rather than immediately jumping to those two variables, plot each of the dimensions like we talked about yesterday as a way to think. Because here, like when you're plotting it out, or even here, you can do the, okay, so I'm going to put a circle around all of it, and I'm going to put a dot in the middle. You have just informally figured out what the average is, but you've got all the rest of that there. So then you're thinking like, okay, so how does this with styrofoam relate to paper or like, how does that relate to how much time it took to get there? Things like that. Another option is, a, you know, we're given, we're given the data or we've collected the data amongst ourselves. This is for an investigation where we're looking at kind of trying to get at the sense of like, is 98.6 a normal or typical body temperature for humans? So again, we like record the data, we could plot it in a graph like we typically do. Instead, what we could do is we could think about our graphs differently. So we could, you know, rather than just writing it down in a data table, we could actually plot with sticky notes what our values are and create in real time this big histogram of the values as we're collecting. We could convert that over to you know, dimensional dot plot if we wanted to, you know, on on paper, or we could build it with those connect dots that math classrooms have, or with Legos. They're fantastic, and I just like go downstairs and get them for my kids all the time. Um, you could then even take it a step farther if you were trying to get kids to figure out that measure of a center, and they're balancing this on a fulcrum and different things like that. So they're all different ways. So it's just this like. How do we think outside the box? How do we think outside the traditional way that we have kids looking at data to create opportunities for them to think about, to conceptually understand how to make sense of the data, but to think about it for more of a like, oh, we're looking at the whole, the whole, and what, what does that mean for the sample that we have? So we talked about this yesterday in terms of gestalt principles to help our students have more information about that variability when they're making sense of this change. You can actually just plot the raw data, circle it up, put a line through the middle of it, and draw the bars down, and the kids now understand where that bar comes from. They have drawn the bars of the bar chart here. Um, 
Similarly, we could have them sort of on a, on a scatter plot. You can have them draw around and kind of connect the middle points of these circles out, getting them a sense of like sort of what's the line chart, how are they connected, do they overlap with one another. Oftentimes when we're looking at sort of scatter plots and we're trying to make predictions forward or we're trying to kind of get a sense of what's going on in the data, we might ask a question of like, okay, well, so if a pot has, this is that black sea bass example we talked about yesterday, if a pot has 15 crabs in it, how many black sea bass would it have? This is the kind of sort of word problem that shows up at a lot in our math classes, but we also make sense of this in our, in our science applications as well. And one of the easiest things we can do is rather than asking for a point value, rather than the look, okay, you read up to the line and you read over, no, you read up to the range and you read over. So then rather than saying 15, which is a deterministic yes, no, and isn't actually accurate representation of what our data indicate, you say, okay, well, it seems like we have anywhere from, like it could be sort of nine to 20 black sea bass we would anticipate if there are 15 crabs in the pot. We can also leverage our online platforms for what they offer. Um, and so we we looked at this a bit in the, earlier in the week with Chuva. Here it is with Data Classroom, where we're making that box plot and we are looking at the actual data values side by side to make sense of it. We can use the um, the resources that they have. So Data Classroom has a lot of supports to try to help students understand what we are actually what different statistical calculations or different information about our data set mean and so they've got this interesting setup to kind of explain the p-value and it gives you kind of a range of the p-value and creates even that kind of mad lib sentence where it fits in your variables to help you think about what is my question and what are the data actually indicating and having them look at a range of different components this is for our older students right so we're not just calculating a value, but we're looking in that, at that value across multiple different values to help us build the context and the understanding. Or we have pull in what they're learning from their math classes, the y equals mx plus b, and have them think about it in different components and have them not just plot the line, but think about, so what, what is that line? That line has an equation to it. If it has been calculated quantitatively, what is the calculation that goes into that and having them use that as we're starting as we're starting to think about okay so what does this mean why are we interested in the slope okay so that means for every change in that many years what does that mean for the number of participating nations in the winter olympics so we take a number and we link it to the variables up back to the question and being explicit about how we help the students do that, as opposed to just like, okay, y equals mx plus b, um, and thinking about it there. We talked about this yesterday with the bars versus you know, the bars versus bands, and helping students make sense of what's going on in the data. And then those re those strategies that we talked about yesterday about layering in the Gestalt principles, those are precursors, informal precursors for some of our statistical analyses. So this is not a line of fit. This is not a line of best fit or a linear regression line, but it is kind of giving us a line of like the general trend. Um, again, not a best fit line, but it is giving us a sense of kind of what we might be looking for. These, these upper and lower bounds kind of gives us a sense of what our confidence intervals are. So how at earlier years can we use a strategy that helps cue their eye into the pattern and also builds the foundation for this is how we make sense of data overall when we have a sample and it is probabilistic rather than deterministic as the, as they are looking at those data and going forward so these are just a couple examples of kind of how all these things can layer on top of one another to set the students up for more success and how we can leverage our visualizations to aid in that mindset growing that mindset of thinking about, okay, we've got a sample, the data values differ for one another, we got to think about this probabilistically, not what is the, you know, what is the answer, one specific thing, right or wrong, but what do the data indicate? What, what does it seem like might be going on in relation to these two variables, things like this? This is a skill that comes with time. Your students have been, or we are inherently driven to be deterministic, 
and our system to date has reinforced that, reinforced those surface attributes, reinforced that right wrong thinking. When it comes to data, reinforce that kind of one and done. There is one claim that my teacher knows from the data, and I just need to figure out what what they know, and then I will be right and I will I will do it correctly. This is a shift. It will take some time, but with scaffolding, what we've seen is that all of our students can make the shift and that by making that shift that sets them up for better success working with data. So I hope that helped. Feel free to reach out if you've got any other questions about this. Happy to talk with you more about it, but hopefully that gives you sort of like a little bit of an understanding of what we mean by this, kind of leveraging the visualizations to help with getting our students to think statistically with data.